All right, good afternoon, folks. We'll get started in just about one more minute. You know the drill, though. You have campus colleagues, friends, coworkers, family members, random folks who would benefit from joining today's really exciting webinar. Please send them a text, send them an email, send out that registration link. This is number four of five. We're really hitting our stride. Okay, I'm seeing the, the number of um, participants is going up and it's gonna keep going up, but I wanna go ahead and get started because I wanna respect everybody's time. We've got a very exciting agenda and lineup of speakers here today. My name is David O'Brien and I am the Vice Chancellor for Government Relations here at the Community College's Chancellor's Office. I'm kicking us off today, but I will not be speaking for long because um, as always, we have a student keynote speaker or in today's case, a student, uh, alum, former uh, keynote speaker, who's gonna be really uh, helping us get started with today's webinar. But you see the, com the, the uh, title of today's webinar, Effectively Using Data in a Complex Environment. And we're gonna talk and learn a lot about what that complex environment means, what it means for you, and how we can understand and better understand the use of data to support our undocumented students. So this is the fourth of five webinars we have scheduled this week for our fifth annual Undocumented Student Action Week. We we'll hope you all have been finding them useful. We we'll hope you've been participating if you're with one of our campuses, if you've been able to participate in some of your campus-based events. We know that there are so many going on. I see them through Twitter every day when I'm scrolling through it. I try and like and retweet as many as I can. Um, but just want to thank our campus partners for being such wonderful participants in Undocumented Student Action Week. Let's advance the slides briefly. Oh, there's my name and picture. I sort of gave away that game. So the goals for today, briefly, is we're gonna understand how data drives institutional change to support undocumented students. We're gonna, this is really important. We are gonna talk about and understand our role as system leaders and campus leaders in supporting our undocumented students as people not simply as data points. And we'll talk about what that means. I'm probably uh, wondering what, what exactly we mean, mean by that, but that's really important. We will get to that. How data and program evaluation are essential partners in achieving equity and how numbers two and three on this slide really interact with one another. And then empower you to take this vision and transform it into action. So there will be some, um, you hate to use the term homework, but there will be, you know, um, at the end, we're gonna ask you to make a commitment to the undocumented students that we all serve. So please do stick around for that. Let's move to the next slide. This is just a reminder of our vision for success goals and the commitments we make. So while I leave this up and I'm not gonna reread them to you because I know you're all very familiar with these and you all walk around with these in your heart every day. I wanna just remind you of a couple of things. I use the Q&A feature here to ask questions. We will be monitoring those and try and get to your questions um, as we can. Um, I also just want to uh, thank in advance um, our wonderful guest speakers here today. In just a moment, I'm going to be introducing you to Hans Miguel de la Cruz Esquera, who uh, currently works at PwC in social, corporate social responsibility, but is a proud community college alum, attended Olona Community College before transferring to UC Santa Barbara. Um, uh, then I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Daisy Gonzalez, our chancellor who will ground us in a lot of the why behind this conversation. Why are we talking about data and the importance of viewing our students as people, not data points and how we use data. We'll then transition from Dr. Gonzalez to Dr. Angelica Suarez, the president of Orange Coast College. And then my colleague, Linda Vasquez, will, be follow, uh, will speak to us a little bit about uh, data and the policy environment, followed by Dr. John Hetz, who heads our research unit here at the Chancellor's Office, providing some more detail and really critical context there. All right, without further ado, I think I covered everything I'm supposed to cover. And like I said, we know that our outstanding student and student alumni speakers this week are the real show and the real reason you are all here today. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Hans. Thank you so much for being here, Hans. Thanks, David. Um, as you can see from the picture, 
Uh, name's Hans Miguel de la Cruz Esquera, pronouns he, his, him. Um, real privilege to be here um, as an alumni. I feel like it's full circle uh, since my community college days. Um, graduate transferred to UCSB in 2014 from Ohlone Community College. Um, a little bit of background on me. I immigrated from the Philippines when I was six years old um, on a work visa with my family. And really how I found out I was out of status was in high school, um, looking to be one of the cool kids and get a driver's license. And upon inquiring with my parents, really just found out that we were undocumented at that point. And that really kind of just changed the trajectory of my life from then on. Um, really speaking about my undocumented student journey, I'll probably, I'll speak first to my UC journey and then go to my community college and then kind of bring it full circle to where I am now. Um, I went to UC Santa Barbara and majored in accounting and economics. The reason for that was throughout my community college career and even my UC career, I didn't really know what I wanted to go into. Um, I think as, as an immigrant, as a lot of you may know, you don't really get exposed to a lot of industries or professions as you're kind of too busy assimilating to the society that you're in. Um, so really wanted the financial security, which kind of just brought me to accounting, you know, good with numbers and had the privilege of majoring in that at UC. But at UC Santa Barbara, I was actually a peer mentor for the Undocumented Student Services Center. And that experience really brought with it a lot of knowledge and wisdom of navigating the UC system and higher education as an undocumented student and held legal workshops, financial workshops to assist other undocumented students within the university. That brought me to really kind of have to upskill myself with navigating legal and financial kind of know-how as an undocumented student in America. And personally, it really just created a sense of belonging and network where it kind of felt like I belonged at the institution, that there were other kids like me going through the same problems and issues within the university. And I think that brings a lot to my purpose in serving others and helping my community. And how I got to UC Santa Barbara, I spent four years at Ohlone Community College, started in 09, transferred out in 2014. I came out of high school not having the financial support or you know, just like being able to afford a four-year university, so community college and with AB 540 really allowed me to pay for that. And how I paid for that was starting and running a mobile car detailing company with a good friend of mine who still runs it to this day in the Bay Area um, and use that to really just fund my education part-time at a community college. And then around 2011, 2012 um, was when the California Dream Act passed, which allowed the Cal Grant and you know really allowed me to financially support my full-time education at community college, which then led to the full-time transfer. And my journey at Ohlone Community College, doing the working as well as doing the part-time education, really didn't have too much support from an undocumented student service standpoint from the college. Um, so a lot of the lessons I learned at UC Santa Barbara was that having that sense of community and support system and knowing that the institution was kind of acknowledging that people like me existed within their system really kind of just helped me um, and if i had that at community college i think that would have just like opened up much more doors as well in terms of where i could go in the future so i think just the legislative actions the people on this call that are really putting that into effect and using data to make that data-driven decision making um, to help people like me um, really just speaks volumes to where the undocumented community is nowadays because I think back then it was hard to find those mentors and coaches that kind of had me and had my background where I could look up to them and see what their actions were. Um, so I think that having, having support systems within the CSUs and the community colleges, um, it's about time, I guess. <laughs> but I think it's I think it speaks volumes to our community and knowing that we are being acknowledged. Um, in my day-to-day -day job, focusing on corporate social responsibility, 
in layman's terms, it's really how corporate America can do better for the world. And with that comes a lot of data. And I think one of the goals that I saw on that slide was that it's people, not data points. And that's truly what a lot of corporate America is focused on now with ESG, environmental social governance is a hot topic and really looking at it from how we impact society in general, not just bottom line profits. So I think the data behind the people and the people behind the data really kind of is a two-way street and with data comes trust and really building that trust. And I think from my experience and knowing that I trusted the people I was giving the data to really just kind of gave me a sense of security around my status and who that was going to be shared with. So I think a lot of what the people in this call will be covering is really just how we use that data, but also build trust at the same time from a qualitative and a quantitative standpoint. So with that, um, thank you for sharing the space with me. It's really a privilege and I look forward to all of the great things you all are gonna be doing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hans. Thank you for inspiring us. It is now my pleasure to transition and to introduce Chancellor Dr. Daisy Gonzalez. Thank you, Vice Chancellor O'Brien. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Hans. Go Gauchos. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for mentoring other students and for joining us today. Uh, buenas tardes. Good afternoon, everyone. It is 1.12 p.m. according to my clock. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, it is an honor to join you today and to begin by centering us in really our strength as a community, as a family. I know that you all have heard me use that word a lot lately. But like some of you, um, I grew up in an immigrant family, an immigrant household where the adults in the home fear formal resources, hospitals, dentists, police for sure, and even back to school night. And I was very lucky to have been born in this country, but that was not the case for my multi-generational home, certainly my, my siblings. And what I saw day to day was the fear, the fear, the trauma, but also that incredible hope that we had in people who actually wanted to help us. And the risks that my parents took every time they would leave the house or anyone in our house who was undocumented was always a risk and it always came with trauma. As a child, I grew up knowing that there could be a, a chance that my siblings who would go to school may not return. And while my parents were not the best parents, which is how I ended up in foster care, I learned that fear is something that we pass on to children and that that trauma is really hard to overcome. And I'm so thankful that Hans mentioned the word trust because that's what happens when we survive trauma. And I know that we are all going through a lot of trauma during this pandemic, but not like the trauma that our undocumented students have to live with every single day. Why do I mention this? I mention this because our students, they're like, I was to my parents, they're our children, right? They're our students. So we need to think about our sphere of influence, who we are as a community, as a community of community colleges, but then the dangers and the situations that we put them in. We have to remember that the other systems, the other institutions that we interact with as colleges, but also that we ask our students to interact with affect their lives. The systems that we rely on, the other institutions may not share the values that we have as a system, may not share the deep commitment to keep our students safe. And that's a part of the work that we have ahead of us. So today, our fourth system-wide webinar for our annual Undocumented Student Action Week begins with me thanking all of you who have been brave enough over the last few years, but more so right now during this pandemic to make this a priority. Those are our partners, certainly all of our students, the Foundation for California Community Colleges, the League of California Community Colleges, all of our faculty, our staff, all the advocacy groups that have joined us throughout this week, but more importantly, year round. I also wanna spend some time just thanking uh, some of the key staff, very hardworking staff behind the scenes, Linda Vasquez, Iris Aguilar, Maricela, Leah, Alonso, 
and all of the students that have been a part of all of our webinars, thank you. So please join me in the chat in expressing our gratitude to those leaders. I wanna know from you, who do you wanna thank today? Who's that undocumented student champion that you wanna thank? And I wanna go out and look at your Q&A chat. Let me see if anyone's sharing anything. Q&A, who do you wanna thank that is an undocumented student action week champion? I'm not seeing any, but I shared some of mine. And for me, that's Iris Aguilar, Linda Vasquez, Maricela, Leah, Alonso, Immigrants Rising, for sure. So thank you. I know you have a full agenda today, and you're going to hear today from Dr. Angelica Suarez, Dr. John Head. So I won't go into too much of what we're sharing today, but I do want to touch on what I'm seeing at the national level and certainly at the statewide level. We're very intentional this week in making sure that our theme included the word action, right? Our job this week was to build greater awareness and support of all of the policies that will allow undocumented students to find success as they are seeking higher education in this country. And I know that we have a lot of work to do, but our work ahead has to be grounded in our ability to put our students first. So today we're gonna to focus and we're gonna honor our responsibility to deploy support for our undocumented students without causing further harm. And what I'm talking about today is a nexus between making evidence-based decision-making, so evidence-based decision-making and bureaucratic institutions, bureaucratic structures. Those are two different things. So I wanna be very clear about this conversation. It doesn't matter who's in the White House or whether they foster an anti-immigrant political environment or developing policies to support immigrant communities. It will always be our top priority as a system and as leaders who say that we are advocates for undocumented students to protect the anonymity of undocumented students and their families at that. And I say that given this morning's news, if you have seen the newspapers, the Ninth Circuit Court overturning ICE orders to release medically vulnerable detainees during a pandemic. And when I read that headline this morning and made it super clear, if we as institutions, is, if we as colleges and as a community do not recognize the humanity of our students, of their families as living beings, then we cannot treat them with compassion, empathy, and dignity. And at the core respect, which Hans reminded us of, and trust, trust. So before I hand it back to Linda, um, and then certainly before uh, I hand it off really to Angelica, who will speak next, I want to focus on three reminders as we think about data. And I'm a recovering researcher, if you recall. Three things to keep in mind as you think about evidence-based decision-making in support of undocumented students. The first is that at the core of wanting to collect information for undocumented students has to be love. We have to love our students. We have to love empowering undocumented students to succeed in their education and as members of our communities. My second point is that when we collect information, our purpose should be structural transformation. We already know the great need that exists. Our connection to collecting any sort of information has to be about challenging the status quo. And then my third point, for any other student population, collecting information is also high stakes, but for our undocumented students, the stakes are higher. So protecting that information, putting in place Val our values, our sacrifices, all of those processes, protecting that information has to be our number one priority. So we have to love our students first before we collect information. We have to collect information that's gonna challenge the status quo and help us build the structures that will actually help our students succeed. And we have to protect that information. So with that, I wanna thank you I wanna thank our speakers, Dr. Suarez, Dr. John Heads, our Assistant Vice Chancellor, Linda Vasquez, for leading us through this conversation and really preparing us for tomorrow's uh, end to a great week 
but a great reminder of the work that we have ahead of us. And thank you for joining us. And I believe, David, we're handing it over to Dr. Swan. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, I have a, so I, first of all, I appreciate um, the opportunity to, um, to, sh to speak with you uh, this afternoon. And um, one of the things I like to do is to talk uh, through, um, through photographs because that, that tells a story. Um, my story, I mean, undocumented student action week is very personal to me. And uh, as Dr. Gonzalez mentioned, um, the experiences um, as an immigrant child, um, recognizing that there is trauma uh, being undocumented and what that means for a family, um, it, it's pretty phenomenal. So that really has uh, informed and shaped my journey in higher education. So I do have uh, the next slide that uh, has some photos that'll give you a little bit of insight into my journey. And um, so I'd like to kind of share that with you. Uh, first of all, um, I'll start with a quote from Lady, uh, First Lady Michelle Obama. She says, each of us comes here by way of our own improbable journey. This is my improbable journey um, that I'm gonna share with you today. The first photo that you see uh, is a photo of uh, when I was three years old and uh, I was born in Caborca, Sonora, but my family is from Jalisco uh, in, in, in Mexico. Um, I identify, you know, who am I? I identify as a Mexican-American Latina woman. Um, as I mentioned, I got to uh, Los Angeles, uh, Southern California when I was three years old. I am, um, I was undocumented until I was 15 years of age uh, in uh, basically during my, um, part of my high school experience. I am a first generation college student. I am a, an English language learner and I am the eldest of six kids. So there is a whole lot there that has shaped the person that I am today and um, my values as a leader and uh, as, a, um, as an immigrant. Uh, my parents uh, immigrated here in the 1970s and as many of our immigrant community immigrating here in search of better opportunities for their family, for the family. My father was part of the Bracero program and worked uh, as a manual uh, laborer picking crops in the Imperial Valley. Both my mom and my dad did not have a higher education. They, they graduated, they, uh, they completed the second grade. My father worked as a gardener and my, mo my mother cleaned homes. Um, and they had big dreams for all of us. There were six of us, six kids in the family and their dreams were that the kids would graduate from high school and really have positions and have employment where they're protected from the elements or working inside um, uh, you know, nice offices so as not to be out there and really working hard um, as they had been and, and were working to support the family. As the eldest, I became the voice of my parents. And again, as, as Dr. Gonzalez mentioned, um, also and as Hans mentioned, as the eldest, you know, here we, uh, there were, there were six of us, three of us, uh, were born in Mexico. My parents were undocumented and um, we had my sister, my youngest sister who had been born here in the US. We, we lived with the uh, fear of my father, my parents, um, my parents being deported. Um, and um, my father, um, you know, every time we heard that there was a raid, we worried because we didn't know whether my father had been deported and what would that mean for our family. So there was definitely much trauma. Uh, as I continued, I, I was in high school and uh, again, part of my parents' dream for all of us was to graduate from high school. So yes, I, I show that photo because uh, what's funny about that is not only is it proof that I graduated from high school, but I don't think we ever actually bought the photos. Um, but again, that was achieving my parents' dream uh, for, for me, graduating from high school. And as I was graduating from high school, uh, my focus was on uh, obtaining full-time employment. I wanted to help support my family. I didn't want to continue, continuously worry about not having enough to pay the rent, worried about um, having enough food or the, um, 
the shame that comes from seeking social support services and, and really not um, not understanding all of the different uh, bureaucratic systems that are designed uh, not always to support uh, people and, and treat them with love as, um, as Dr. Gonzalez mentioned. Anyhow, in high school, I have an, ama I have an amazing uh, counselor um, that encouraged me to attend an outreach event for, um, from the local community college. And that is where my, um, my journey into higher education began where I started seeing myself in, in different ways um, than what I had initially um, had in mind for my career path, which was basically working full time at a florist to help support my family. I went on to the community college um, and again, supported, um, supported through a, a, a network of people that again, championed my experience where, I, um, where they validated um, my experiences through support and move, I, I then was able to move on to Long Beach State University where I finished my, master, my bachelor's and my master's degree. Um, I, sh I have one of the photos that you have here is my doctoral degree. Um, throughout my educational experience, my mother uh, would say to me when I finished my bachelor's, when I finished my uh, master's, Mija, ya terminaste? Uh, honey, are you finished with your education? No quiero que te enfermes. I don't want you to get sick with all of this education. And uh, when I finished my, um, I moved on to um, to pursuing my doctoral degree. Again, not something that was ever part of my uh, my pathway or my uh, my dreams. Uh, my mother uh, said to me, "Mija, ya terminaste?" And I said, "Yes, mom. I have I have finished." And uh, you know, the pride that comes with my mother being able to share with her many of her. Um, uh, neighbors, uh, my daughter is another doctora. Um, you know, comes with a whole lot of questions that I was not prepared to answer around medical uh, questions. But it's again creating a trajectory that changes, um, you know, a cycle of um, of not continuing with education to one where higher education is part of the expectation. And again, um, what was instrumental for me was a community college and the and the sense of belonging that was created at, uh, at my community college. So I share with you the other, the photo where it says a new college going tradition. These are all my uh, uh, nieces and my nephews and, and my brothers and sisters, knowing that that first level, all of the nieces and um, nephews will now either are in college or are expected to go to college. And again, that is something that the community college did for me. Again, empowering an immigrant student letting her know that she belonged and that there was a future and to have hope uh, to the person again the position that I have today and, and the roles that I've played throughout my educational career. The last photo that I share with you uh, in the slide is the journey that brought me to Orange Coast College and again throughout the many uh, uh, positions that I've held in community colleges being in a position as president of this, uh, this community college allows me to understand the different pathways of our students, the different um, experiences that our student, students bring to the table and how we can use those experiences to really create inclusive environments. If we can stop sharing the screen, that would be helpful. Um, well, we'll leave it on the screen. Okay. Uh, so, you know, as we were talking about, you know, how does this experience um, inform my leadership? I always think about the experiences and the, um, the support that I received as a community college student. And one of the most important things for me was being, um, being seen, uh, being visible and being supported uh, through, um, through not only uh, you know, some of the financial aid that was provided, some of the programming, but also just um, recognizing that, that there, was, there were experiences that I had had as an immigrant. Um, and um, you know, at Orange Coast, one of the things that we do in terms of you know, using data, and again, going back to the, um, to the point that was made earlier regarding data and ensuring that we are being mindful of protecting our students, is making sure that we're also looking at all of our qualitative data. How do we um, how do we create 
uh, uh, how do we facilitate a process without all of the bureaucracy that comes with different systems and know that our students have uh, a single point of contact that they can go to to be connected to various services. And so that, again, that is something that um, at the college we have developed as um, we call it um, uh, the name of our program is Undocu Scholars and having an un and being in the process of developing an Undocu Scholar Center where again students will be able to access many of those resources in one location. Um, so I think those are just you know some of the things that um, that we can do in terms of leveraging support working with our student organizations where our students can tell, tell us these are the, the, the services that we need. And again, leveraging data to be able to, to provide that support. And knowing that, again, behind every data point, there is a story, there is a journey, there is an experience. And how do we surface that to, to make sure that we, our, our budgetary plans are being informed by, by what our students need? So I am going to take a pause there. I know that. Um, uh, uh, there may be some questions or we want to continue with the different presentations and hopefully allow for some questions at the end. But uh, thank you for allowing me to share a little bit of my journey with you. And then again, how that experience informs my leadership and some of the work that we do at the college to help support, to create an inclusive campus for all of our students and support our undocumented students with very uh, centralized supports um, that is easily accessible and also protects their privacy and confidentiality. Um, throughout this process. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suarez. Um, everyone, please join me in a virtual round of applause to thank our speakers. And I'm going to try to keep it together um, because just listening, you know, when we host these webinars, we don't just have, you know, scripts on the slides. We like to have photos, but those photos are just to start the conversation. Like you're hearing from real people whose experiences certainly align with the topic at hand. And for me, I, I resonated so closely with the story of Dr. Suarez as a, an undocumented immigrant myself and a father uh, who is still gardener, already years as a proud gardener. I'm very proud of that. I had shared recently online that I had brought my parents up to Sacramento. I moved up here and gave them a tour of the Sacramento of the Capitol grounds. And my dad knew every tree. I, I'm not surprised, but I knew every tree and my parents are so proud and I use my positionality now as in my position, in my role at the chancellor's office to help shape policies for people like me, people like Angelica Suarez, people like Hans. Um, and so that, that's why our, our roles are so important, why these conversations are important. I did want to acknowledge, you know, some of the comments in the Q&A of people who are giving appreciation and uh, acknowledgments to colleagues, family, friends. Um, I think some of them have been um, highlighted or addressed, but Professor Carroll, uh, Ingrid Vasquez, Aldo Cruz and Brenda at Butte. I also wanna give thanks to our colleagues at Butte and Hartnell, appreciation for allies at Cerritos, Alejandro Delgadillo at Merced, and the list goes on, so keep them in. And uh, it just so happens that as a, you know, the book next to my desk is All About Love by Bell Hooks. And uh, I'm never surprised by what Dr. Uh, Gonzalez says, but I really appreciated her opening with the comments about love. And in the words of, you know, Bell Hooks, love is an action, never simply a feeling. And that's certainly what is going to ground us in today's conversation. Um, Imran, if you can pull up the next slide with the Undocu Student Pathways, I want to continue to center the conversation before I give it over to my colleague, Dr. John Hetz. You know, um, I think we've used this slide in the past, and I'm sorry, there's a number two missing up there, uh, the K-12 system above. Uh, every year, tens of thousands of undocumented students graduate from high school, and the majority of them decide to enroll at one of our community colleges. We enroll more undocumented students than the CSU and UC combined. And yet only 10% of undocumented students pursue, um, uh, pursue a college, uh, um, who will graduate with a degree. And as a primary entry point for the majority of California high school graduates and the system that serves the highest number of undocumented students, we need to ensure that we are 
identifying those points of intervention, the resources, the policies that we need to create and scale to ensure that we have more than 10%, that 100% of our students who walk through our doors and express an intent to transfer, earn a credential, or want to upskill, that they, that they achieve that goal. And our students navigate so many systems, so many layers of red tape and bureaucracy. You see lots of layers here in this slide, but there's so many invisible layers of bureaucracy. I think our conversation around utilizing data and information to drive change attempts to eliminate those, those layers of red tape, attempts to make sure that students aren't having to navigate all these layers to simply to get an, uh, questions to one of their answers. Our students shouldn't have to go to five different departments or ask five different people before they get their question answered. Next slide. A bit of policy landscape, right, to help understand why ongoing reflection and analysis about you know, points of intervention and supports for undocumented students is that we have a strong background and history in California in developing policies that support undocumented students. We have AB 540, we have the California Dream Act, we have an extension to AB 540, SB 68, that allows more students who did not necessarily attend and earn three years of high school to qualify for AB 540. And most recently with AB 1645, the creation of Dream Resource Liaisons and state investment to create and fund immigrant Im immigration legal services. Now, all of these policies aren't successful just in name only or when the governor signs the bill, right? They are successful when they're implemented with fidelity. Well, how do you implement them with fidelity? How do you know you're making progress? Well, it's by utilizing data and information. Next slide. So the title of today's conversation is utilizing data in a complex environment. And what do we mean by complex environments? Because in addition to helping support our undocumented students in earning their, their degree or achieving their goal, our top priority is to ensure their privacy. And so we have to understand that delicate balance between privacy and sensitivity and program evaluation, which does require data. Um, this year's theme, Change in Action, compels us to get out of the pit, I call the pit, of what we often fall into of we need more data, we need more data, and actually start, start thinking about action. We will never have enough data, um, but we must start thinking about what we can do with the information we have to start driving change. And the hard work that has gone into shaping the policies and laws I shared in the previous uh, slide, again, are contingent on being able to move towards action. Next slide. And so before I hand it over to Dr. John Hetz, let me just share that, you know, again, and going to the theme of a humanity, these aren't just photos from Getty Images. These are real photos of our students on campuses before COVID, of course, when they were having it on in-person events. So as we think about utilizing data and informa information to drive change, think about your students. And I know I am preaching to the choir. Almost everybody, I went through the participant list and I recognize a lot of you on here. You are the boots in the ground. You are um, the decision makers. And so you know this very well, right? You, you drive decisions, you lead your programs with the names of your students in mind, not just numbers, and that's powerful. So for everyone listening today, think about the role that you play as an undocu ally as a, a designated undocu liaison, as a college president, as a trustee, as a dean, as a faculty member, the role that you play in making that meaningful progress towards ensuring that undocumented students are able to reach their educational goals. So with that, I will um, uh, introduce my colleague, if you can go to the next slide, Dr. John Hetz, who is a I like to uh, call like a data celebrity, a true honor for him to be joining the chancellor's office as a visiting executive who will walk us through some of the data components that we need to think about when measuring program evaluation and student success. Dr. John Hitz. All right, thank you. If we could go to the next slide. So um, I think we've covered some of this ground already, but I think it's worth 
covering it again because it's important. So the challenge that we face in the space is we have to balance two competing, not competing, but two different goals that we hold dear, supporting our undocumented students while we make sure to protect them, right? So we have to balance those two things. Our undocumented students deserve the same experiences as all of our students. They deserve to have support so they can succeed academically. They deserve to have the financial support necessary to thrive at our institutions and generally, and they deserve to feel safe and welcome on every single campus in our system. Serving our undocumented students equitably requires understanding their unique needs and challenges without compromising the security of the information about their status. And that's a difficult and, and delicate dance that we have to undergo. Next slide. So we have to hold both of these commitments simultaneously. They are deep dual commitments that we make to our undocumented students. We need to find ways that we can collect information to, to help us understand our undocumented students experiences, their experiences before they get to our campuses, but also their experiences on our campuses, their experiences with our campus climate, their experiences in our classroom. Um, we also wanna make sure that we are understanding how they are experiencing the quality of our programs, our services, of our communications, of our web resources. Um, and we want to do that in two very different ways, right? We want to understand how they are experiencing the general program services and communications that we have, because that may be different than the experiences that other students that we serve have. But we also want to make sure that we are carefully collecting information about their experience of the quality of program services and communications that are designed specifically and especially for them. And so we have to make sure that we are collecting that information um, so that we can make sure that those programs work, that those services help our students, that the communications um, are meaningful and do what they're supposed to do and get the information to our students that they need. Uh, and I think a really another important part of this uh, that sometimes gets left off from some of these conversations is we need to make sure that we are collecting meaningful information about our staff and faculty knowledge about the rights of our undocumented students and how best to support our undocumented students. Um, and making sure that every person at all of our campuses have that information at hand, part of what we have to do is not only provide it to them, but check to make sure that they understand those resources and understand the needs and ways to support our students. So that's a lot of things that I just mentioned that is very pivotally important that we collect. However, we have to balance that against linking any of that information to personally identifiable information for our students. The risks there are significant and we have to make sure that we are doing everything we can to mitigate them. Because as soon as you link any of that information, there is a risk of accidental um, sharing of that information. There is a risk of purposeful or malignant sharing of that information. And there is the risk of legally compelled sharing of that information. So we need to make sure that we are doing everything we can to A, not link information to our students uh, and to as much as possible, keep information about our students' status private and secure. Uh, that has got to be part and parcel of this. So how do we balance those two needs? Next slide. So there are a variety of different ways that we can use evidence, that we can collect information that helps us to better understand our students and their needs and lead to action that does not link that information to students and put, their, uh, put them at risk. So part and parcel of things that we can do here are anonymous surveys. So whenever we've uh, provided a service or uh, had people interact with the resource, we ask them, did it work? Did it help you? Did it do what we intended? Um, and it's really important that whenever we do that, there's no links between that survey and the student, right? Because that allows possibly tracking back. Um, and again, we want to do that for both specific services and general services, right? So that we are asking about how students interact with any particular service or program that we have that we want to understand its effectiveness. And we just need to make sure that we are, again, in an anonymous fashion, collecting information about um, undocumented students and how they are interacting with that service, right? So we don't want to link that to our, their identity, but we do want to make sure that we understand their experiences specifically. And to do that, we have to include 
ways to collect that information within the safe anonymous survey. Um, we also have, many of us have campus climate surveys, classroom climate surveys, evaluations. There are ways for us to use all of those uh, pieces of information uh, that we collect as long as we are collecting the information about whether or not uh, we have undocumented students answering those questions, right? And if we include that and we maintain the anonymity of that, that helps us to, to understand the effectiveness of what we're doing for our undocumented students and get better. Uh, one of the core things that you see across all kinds of best practices, um, and this really needs to happen anywhere that we are connecting to data, is for our undocumented students, limiting the types of information that we collect or require for access to things um, is pivotally important, right? Those are the types of things where we typically will add questions that might accidentally reveal student status and then be connected to them. And so that's very important. Uh, if you've seen how uh, we've designed things across the system, we have tried to mitigate that and eliminate those types of things, those barriers to student participation by changing the way that we ask questions. It's also important as a campus that you establish very clearly what you count as directory information um, so that you don't put yourself in a position where you might be compelled to provide information about student status because of a lack of clarity. Most importantly, there's all kinds of very meaningful ways for us to interact with students directly. Um, so carefully designed protocols for qualitative ethnographic data collection, where we engage with our students uh, in, uh, in a private setting, right, that protects their identity, um, but gives them the opportunity to surface their, the issues that they're facing at our college, the issues that they're facing outside of our college, the needs that they have, and what the impacts of our programs and services are for them. And that really should be our first line of information for all of this work. Um, one of the things that I do wanna make sure to add, uh, and this has been highlighted a couple of times, including by Dr. Gonzalez early on, is there are significant risks here to our students if we fail in protecting this information. And so anytime you're working with this information uh, program, an institution, you should be applying something akin to very careful high level institutional review, right? Similar to what would be required if you were doing high risk human subjects research, because collecting and holding that information about students puts them at real significant risk. Uh, I think we're all relatively happy right now that that risk is probably lower than it's been in the recent past, but I do not think that we can um, rest easy to believe that that information if held by us, does not continue to constitute a significant risk. Next slide. So this is one of those places where we really have to be nuanced. We have to work hard so that we safely surface our undocumented students' opinions and experiences, the needs that they have. Um, we need to, in that work, make some space to do parallel work with other students to surface how the experiences of our undocumented students are similar or different. And again, we wanna look for uh, what we're trying to do is make sure we're identifying systemic issues that um, run through all of our processes at an institution or unique issues where the processes that we have are having differential impact for our undocumented students. A really important part of this conversation, a lot of people think about how we do this work after we've delivered something, right? And what if we're going to be serious about understanding the experiences of our undocumented students, we need to make sure that that is a big part of our upfront design of new programs and services. Are we thinking about how we are going to understand the impact of these programs? How are we involving undocumented students and undocumented student liaisons in the conversations and the development of these programs so that they are from the beginning authentically centered on the needs of our uh, undocumented students? We also have a collectively shared accountability here to equitably prioritize our students in all of our work. And we have to work to anticipate and address identified barriers that we already know exist and facilitators for performance that we already know exist for undocumented students. We don't have to wait when we know that there is a variety of research out there on best practices for undocumented students and how to support them in our institutions in how to make them feel welcome uh, and to help them succeed at each one of our colleges. 
And I'm going to circle back uh, for my closing thought to something that um, Dr. Gonzalez led with. And I think one of the things that we always have to be attuned to here is the search for information, the felt need for data should not stand in the way of action. And we have collectively an enormous amount of information already that we know um, that uh, for what we can do, what the needs and, and uh, issues that our undocumented students have and how best to support them. We have to be careful about the desire sometimes to get more information when we already have enough information to act because our students can't wait for us to have perfect information and we have enough. And so there are ways for us to get better. I think there is a powerful um, uh, set of methods that we can deploy institutionally that can help us get better, but we can't afford to wait for better and more information in order to support our undocumented students on their journey to completion. So I, I think I'm turning it back over to you, Linda. Thank you, Dr. John Hetz. Um, we do have a few minutes before we close and um, before we get to my closing remarks, um, did we wanna use this time to address any questions that came in the chat? Let me just take a look. Um, and John, uh, Dr. Hetz, you can also ask any follow-up questions of Dr. Suarez if you'd like to. I did address a question, I just responded actually, but let me just share it live by Ariana Gonzalez. She asked, what advice do you have for undocumented students, non-DACA, who enter allied health fields? Is there a way to get them through the background check without a social security number? Uh, now, I'll, I'll kind of read off what I um, dropped in the chat, um, Dr. Suarez, but if you have any feedback you'd like to offer, feel free to chime in here. Um, law signed in 2014 by then Senator Ricardo Lara allow certain immigrants uh, to qualify for vocational fields. And I dropped a link to access more information. We can certainly set up a one-on-one -on -one to uh, discuss in greater detail, but this is open for um, students who don't necessarily have DACA. So it is another way to expand employment opportunities. And I know that that has been top of mind for Ricardo Lara, as well as other legislators, is absent DACA, what other pathways to employment and career can we provide for students? And this is one policy. So Linda, one thing I think I would share um, is I, I just want to note the powerful way in which people have remembered advocates. One of the most important predictors of student success and completion, especially amongst community college students, is feeling that they found an advocate or someone that knew them at their institution. It might be a faculty member, it might be a staff member, it might be a member of the, leader, uh, of the leadership team. And I'll tell you, it also might be researchers because a couple of students have found me over my career and they just need to find someone who's willing to listen and help them and get them through to where they're going. And so I just wanna appreciate all of the people that you've recognized and all the people that we haven't recognized because that experience is what makes or breaks college for a large proportion of our students. Thank you for naming that. And I think that's a living example of how you lead with love. Um, I did want to call out one question that came in from um, a good friend of mine, uh, Trustee Zika Hernandez from Rancho Santiago Community College District. And um, Dr. Suarez, if you're still on, I'd actually like to give this to you. Is how are we supporting the formation of undocu student clubs are there any community college campuses um, that have those? And with this, how do we provide the safeguards for these student groups? Excellent question. Yeah, I, I can't tell, I'm managing my technology, which is not always, it's really me, it's user error. Um, so one of the things that my previous institution and in, in now at Orange Coast, there are um, student organizations that, um, you know, part of the work that we do is really creating and uh, creating an inclusive campus is having also um, undocu ally training. So, you know, what does this mean and how can we can be supportive um, using many of the safeguards that John, you've just mentioned in terms of, you know, sometimes we want to be supportive and in doing so could put our students at risk. So we want to do this, you know, safely. 
Um, but in in that training, having the having a campus wide training uh, creates opportunities for undocu allies, and with those allies also come opportunities for club advisors. So you know, all colleges have uh, student organizations. A student could basically come in and say, and I know at Orange Coast it happened. Um, I was just chatting with our um, one of our administrators. Uh, that students wanted to start an um, undocu, uh, undocu scholars program or, or club. And it was an issue of finding someone that could serve as an advisor. So again, the more we can provide training on how we can be supportive, one of the ways to be supportive is having faculty members or staff members that can serve as club advisors um, and, and then creating um, opportunities for students to be able to, to gather in places that are that provide that that privacy. Um, so again, I think that that's it's creating a base of support through training, and then uh, connecting students with allies that can serve as a club advisors. Uh, and we we certainly have that at Orange Coast. That's a fantastic example of opportunity. Like this question, how do we provide safeguards for student groups who want to form on our campus? Is a fantastic example of places where there are we have processes in place that might put our students at risk that we don't realize, right? So when you schedule a room, you put the name of the club on it. So then that leads you to think carefully or should lead us to think carefully about, well, maybe the information that we collect for room reservation purposes needs to change so that it doesn't put students at risk, right? And so that's the type of thing that we need to very carefully attend to across all of these things. We have lots of normal processes that were designed without thinking about the needs and risks for undocumented students that are this secret minefield of possible risks. And so uh, I really appreciate the importance of training to think carefully about these things and to interrogate the existing processes we have to dismantle those minefields before one of our students steps on one. Well, uh, I this has been certainly a learning, a big learning moment for me um, and teaches me that doesn't matter what administration, both in the state of California or nationally we have is we should always be very, very careful on guard. I don't know if those are the right words, but intentionality is key. Even though the intentions are really good, we must be very careful and intentional about how that information is used. And I know everyone on this call leads with love, all of our speakers, our presenters, and our present and the people who are tuning in. I wanna give everyone a shout out for the work that you're leading. And if you can walk away thinking, oh, what, what will I do differently? Or what is this, what is this conversation teach me? That's the homework I'm gonna leave you with. So you can, um, go to the next slide and run, or in a moment, I'm just gonna close because I know we're at time. Just a, a couple of a key things for, for you all to think about. Chancellor Dr. Daisy Gonzalez often, you know, tells us, and she shared it today, tells us that, you know, we can't depend on others, policymakers, or even me, Linda Vasquez, uh, you know, others to drive change. We need to lead it. You need to lead it. Everyone on this call needs to lead it. And so I'm going to leave you with some homework. Tomorrow, actually, you can... Um, Go to the next slide, Imran. Yeah. Tomorrow, we will be kicking off this webinar by asking a few open-ended questions in our Q&A, and that will be led by Vice Chancellor David O'Brien. Um, and we want to start that conversation about policy context with today's discussion in mind. So I want you to think about, you know, what information do I need, you in your respective role, What am I walking away with? Like, what do I need in my respective role to better serve and support undocumented students and their families while still protecting their privacy and keeping them out of harm's way? The second question I want you to think about is what actions can you and your colleges commit to taking to support your undocumented students with regards to data collection? Now, if you aren't able to join us for the conversation tomorrow, I'll leave you with those two questions. Because after this, those are really good questions to bring back to your campus community, your campus pod, 
as you continue to identify ways to support undocumented students. And so this is the webinar we have planned for tomorrow, policy context, undocumented students' rights and resources. It's not just a conversation about policies in California that provide access and support for undocumented students, but it is their right, right? It is their right to access state financial aid. It is their right under AB 540 for in-state tuition. And so we'll be leading that conversation with a framework in mind. So make sure you register. You don't wanna miss out on hearing from these amazing speakers, Chancellor Francisco Rodriguez, uh, the Honorable Assemblywoman Blanca Rubio, and a few of the co-founders of the Leticia 8 Network, Irma Archuleta and Alfred Herrera. Uh, I mean, before I end, I just want to thank all of our partners who've been, uh, uh, you know, behind this effort. You may only hear from me or Vice Chancellor O'Brien or our Chancellor, Dr. Daisy Gonzalez, but there are a lot of people who have made this week possible, and that includes the Foundation for Community Colleges, the Community College League of California, and so many other partners. So on behalf of the Chancellor's Office, we want to thank you. And that wraps up our webinar for today.